Welcome back to the Space Invaders course. In our last lesson, we got our development system set up, so we're now ready to start writing some actual code. To begin with, we're going to have a look at how our software can store information. We're going to need to remember a number of values which will represent certain things like the position of our Space Invaders or the position of our missiles. And our computer is going to need to keep track of this information throughout the software. This game data only needs to be stored while our program's running. So we're going to make use of some things called variables, which allow us to use the computer's internal memory to store information. You can think of variables as storage boxes in the computer's memory. Your software can then put data, numbers, words, or whatever else it wants to store into this box. So say we wanted to keep track of how many aliens were currently on the screen. We can create a box to store this number, but we need to give it a label so that we know what that number means. So in our example, we now have a variable named numAliens, and we can put the value 4 in there. Now a lot of the code that we write is involved with manipulating this data so storing information, retrieving that information, and altering that information. So let's have a look at how we do that with our code. To put numbers into a variable, we do something called assigning a value. This statement uses the assignment operator, or the equal sign. And the way we read this is that we are taking the variable numAliens, and we're assigning the value 4 to it, or, or put in number 4 into the variable. We can then use this variable to do other calculations. So let's say we wanted to create a second variable which will hold double the number of aliens. So we name our variable and then we assign it a value based on the value of our first variable numAliens. So when our software sees us calling the numAliens variable it will have a look at what's inside that variable and then use that number in our assignment. So let's try this out for real by writing some code. I've loaded up the Tick80 software here. So if I press the escape key, that will take me to my code editor. And as we saw before, by default, Tick80 loads in this little default uh, demo program. So we can use this as a starting point to put in our own software. So let's take out the bits we don't need. So we don't need these um, bits here. And then there's a block inside where it says function tick and end. We need to take that out as well. So this gives us then our template for our blank new piece of code. Up at the top here, we have what are known as some comment lines. So, so this minus minus says that this line is a comment, which is a little note to us or to the Tech80 software. So the first line here is just telling us what the title of this game is. So we're just going to call this one Lesson 1. The author then, again that would be your name. A short description. You can describe this um, piece, piece of software if you want. So I'm just going to call it Lesson 1 again. But then this last line here, where it says script, this is actually a little note to the Tick80 system to tell us what language this code has been written in. And we're going to be using Lua, which is the default language, because um, that's a nice one for us to learn with. This bit here, where it says function tick, this is part of the way that Tick80 works. We're going to be looking at functions later in the course, um, but just for now, this function has to be present for Tick80 to work. And what's going to happen is this this is the known as the game loop. Um, this little function here gets called 60 times per second to keep our game running. So we just leave that in for now. OK, so let's start by making a little variable. What we're going to do is we're just going to create a variable. We're going to make it count up um, from 0. And we're going to display its current value on the screen. So when Tick80 runs, it comes starts at the top of the program and it works its way down. So the first thing it's going to come to of real code is where we're going to assign a value to a variable. 
So I'm going to call my variable count. I'm going to say I'm going to assign that a value of zero. So when the program starts off, we create this variable count and we give it a value of zero. The next bit of our program then is all going to be based inside this tick function. And as I said, that gets called 60 times per second. So inside here, we're going to put our line of code, which is going to make count increase by one each time. Now, when we're inside a block of code, such as this function, we tend to indent it by pressing the tab key. <clears throat> and this just really tells us which bits, lines of code are part of this function. So we're going to then assign a new value to the variable count. So we're going to say count, assign it the value of what it currently is, plus 1. So in other words, this new value for count is going to be what it currently is with 1 added on to it. So it's going to gradually creep up and up and up. What we then want to do is to print this on the screen. So there's a handy function called print, and that will print things on the screen for you. It then takes a number of what we call parameters, in other words, some information it needs about what to print, and that has to go inside some brackets. So we open up a bracket, and the first parameter it takes is what to print. So we're going to get it to print whatever is inside the variable count. We then need to tell it where to print. Now, Tick80 uses a coordinate system, in other words, sort of X and Y values, to tell it where on the screen to print. And up in this top left-hand corner, this is where we have the 0, 0 value. So our, so our 0, 0 value is here. If we move this way, we so to, to the right, that increases our X value. If we move down the screen, that increases our Y value. Okay, so when we're given this print one, we have to give it a comma. Then our next number is our X value. So if we're going to print it up in the very top left-hand corner, that would be 0. And our Y value would also be 0. And we then close our brackets. Now, we're going to run this program. So if you press Escape, that will take you back to our command line. And we can type the command run. But if we do that, we'll see that we're getting things happening up here, but it's not quite what we want. Our code obviously isn't working correctly. This is known as a bug in our software, and it's our job now to try and fix this bug by finding out what's gone wrong. So we need to stop the program running by pressing the escape key. And what we saw there was that we had something appearing up here but it looked like we just didn't get to see it because everything that was left on the screen was getting in the way. So if we go back to our code, what we'll find with the Tick80, the way it works, is that un unless you tell it to do something, it will leave the screen as it is. So what we need to do is put a line in here which actually clears everything else off the screen so that we can see the new stuff we're putting on. And there's a special command for that, which CLS, which means for clear screen, and then we have to put brackets after it, uh, because this is actually a function call. But as I say, we'll meet functions later on. So let's try our software out with that line in place. So again, we press the escape key to get back to our console, type run, and now we see our software running as we expected it to. So pressing the escape key will stop the software running. And we can go back into our code editor again by pressing the escape key. So let's build a little bit upon this program. So let's now have a look at using the value of this in some calculations. So let's create a new variable here. And this is going to be our double variable. And we're going to do that to actually have it equal to double the count value. So we're going to start off by initialising it, okay, and setting, in other words, setting its value at the very beginning to be zero. What we're then going to do is, after we update our count variable, 
We're then going to make our double variable and we're going to assign it a value of the count variable times 2. And again, the times sign in um, computer language tends to be the asterisk symbol. We now want to print out the value of our double variable. So again, we're going to say print and then our variable, which we call by name. We're going to have it up against the, the left hand edge of the screen, so 0. But we're going to move it down the screen a bit so it doesn't go on top of the first count variable. So we'll give that a value of 8. So we've created our double variable here. We've assigned it a value. We've based it on the ver value of the count variable and simply done it times 2. So double will always be twice what count is. So again, if we press our escape key and run that, we now have our two variables being shown on the screen, with the bottom one being twice the value of the top one. So again, press escape to come out of that code, and escape to go back into our code editor. Now, so far the variables we've been using are just little dummy variables. But let's look at a real use of variables in our system. At the moment we've got our two numbers being printed out in the top left of the screen. And we've done that by using some numbers here which specify where they need to be printed. But what if we want to change that, that where they get printed? At the moment we've built in these numbers but if we want to change it then we would have to come in here and change the actual numbers in our code. So if I wanted to move it into the middle of the screen I could put something like uh, 100 here and 100 here and then if I ran that you'll see we have our numbers appearing in the centre of the screen. So back to our code editor. If we were doing lots of printing and had these numbers built into say 20 or 30 lines in our code it would get very cumbersome to actually make any changes and this is where our variables come in very handy so what we can do at the top here is we can make some variables which are going to tell us where we print the things on the screen so let's create a variable called x which is going to tell us how far to the right of the screen we print and let's set that equal to 0 to begin with and then create our variable y which tells us how far down the screen and we'll set that to 0 as well. So when we look at our print statement we see that our first line here where we print out just the value of count we can actually print that where our variables tell us to print it. So at the moment that would be at 0, 0, which is back to where we started. But when we print our double variable, we know that we want that the same x value, so, the, so it will line up um, in a left to right way, but we want that to be 8 pixels lower than the y value. So we do that, so we can then say, so y plus 8. So if we now run that bit of software, we should be back to where we first started. And there we go. If I escape out of that, and then escape again to get back to our code, what we can now do is we can now control where everything gets printed simply by changing the value of these variables. So I could print it in the very middle of the screen by saying I want to print it printed 100 pixels across the screen and let's print it 50 pixels down the screen and again if I run that we now get the numbers appearing bang in the middle of our screen. So this idea of using variables to store information we can see that that then means that when we build our code and we base it on our variables
we've got a very powerful way of quickly controlling how our code works and how values are calculated within our code. So that's where we're going to leave it for this lesson on variables. But to finish off with, let's just see how we can save our work as we're going along. So we've now written a piece of code and we're going to save that now so we have a record of what we've been working on. So if we press the escape key to get back out to our console, what we can do is we have a command called save and we then just give it a file name. So we're going to call this one lesson one. So if I hit on, click on that, you can see it's now saved this idea of a cart. So in, in Tick80 we call saved files a, a cart and we've called it lesson one and it automatically puts on this .tick extension. And what this means is that when we come back in again, we can use the load command to pick up from where we were. So if I go load lesson one, that will load back in this bit of code that we've just been working on. Okay, so in the next lesson, we'll look at some animation of our, of our code, and I'll see you in lesson two. Don't forget to visit the course pages for this project. There you'll be able to download the code for this lesson and get lots of extra hints and tips. You'll also get access to all my other programming, electronics and gaming projects. All the links are in the description below. For more games programming, electronics projects and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.